Time is 6.37. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to Breakfast with Anne and Martin. Shall we have a look at today's newspapers? Yeah, the, day, the Sunday Mirror leads with Lioness. We can. Nation rules our heroines on as team promise game of their lives. As England face Spain, of course, later this morning in the World Cup final. And the Independent go with families demand full public inquiry into killer nurse as Lucy Letby joins the grim list of Britain's most notorious serial killers. Boat crisis is EU revenge for Brexit. On the front page of the Sunday Express, a former British Borders chief has suggested that the migrant boats crisis is a punishment for Brexit. That was yesterday's story, really. Yeah. I'm surprised they were going with it again today. Uh, the Mail, uh, the Lioness is, of course, possibly becoming the first England side since 1966 to win a senior final on the global stage. King Charles urging the team to roar to victory. And that's the front page of the Mail on Sunday. So shall we go through the papers now? Joining us this morning, editor of Spiked, Tom Slater, and author and broadcaster, Nikki Hodgson. And a very good morning to you good both. Morning. Morning. Superb. So, right. Tom, let's kick off the ongoing inquest, which is going to be extraordinary mm. now, into the circumstances surrounding Lucy Letby. I mean, it looks like now the whistleblowers, the doctors who were correct and often were forced to apologise, are now after the managers. Tell us more. Well, that's one of the details about this which is so shocking. Obviously, there's the horror of the crimes themselves, but mm. also there's the details that have since come out of the way in which time after time you have particularly consultants, but other people who worked at the hospital with Lucy Letby raising these concerns, even at one point, as you say, being forced to sign this apology letter to her specifically. Um, it seems like there was such an incentive on the part of the hospital to not only tamp down the concerns of these whistleblowers, but to keep it very much out of the police's remit. And so, naturally, a lot of the discussion has turned to... There's obviously very tight regulation of people who are doctors themselves. Why is that not applied to hospital managers? You know, in the same way that a doctor can be struck off, could you strike off a hospital manager if they were proven mm. to be acting in such a horrendous fashion, not least because of the fact that the chief executive of this particular hospital went on, even after yeah. this scandal, mm. to some quite lucrative positions. It's one of those difficult things where, in the wake of something horrible like this, the, the desire is to find some kind of neat mechanism which would stop it from happening. I don't think you can ever really find anything like that. These issues are off... You know, cases like this are mercifully, incredibly I rare. I mean, there's there are there's parts sort of... of this you just can't forgive, can you? Because, mm. because you are the... <clears throat> if, you're, if your major consultant mm -hmm. doctors, tried and trusted professionals, come to you, yeah. and not just one, but there were about six, I think even <laughs> eight at some yeah. point, yeah. keep coming to you and saying, there's something going on here, we may have a murderer in our midst, and to, to absolutely dismiss them is just... It, th th you can't get your head around that. You, you can't get... And I agree it's unforgivable, and I think in this particular instance, of course, everyone involved in, essentially, what, you, what some are calling a cover-up should be held to account for it. Mm. I think the issue is there's always this desire to introduce some sort of tick-box process across the whole piece, which isn't necessarily going to resolve the issue. But I think anything that's going to create more accountability for yeah. those managers is obviously sacrosanct, because you can't have an issue where people are not just failing upwards, but failing upwards after the most horrendous kind of moral failures. That surely can't be. But it is true, Nicky, to say that it seems, a bit like with the Rotherham grooming gang scandal, you know, when a crisis hit, their natural instinct was, was to kind of try and protect themselves. And if you were one of those staff who blew a whistle on a serial killer and you were correct and you were forced to apologise to them, now you're going to be spitting feathers, aren't you? Oh, my gosh. I mean, the thing is about clinicians is that they're not only profoundly medically skilled, they know a lot about people. Because, mm. actually, being a really good clinician is reading between the lines of the information that patients yeah. don't tell you, isn't it? It's figuring out the backstories for why somebody is presenting to you with certain kinds of symptoms. So they're actually really good readers of people. So if you... I think it is seven or eight, isn't it? So if you've mm. got seven or eight of them repeatedly saying, you really need to watch this person, especially in that power dynamic, because usually these kinds of these kinds of incidents happen when somebody's in a position of seniority. Mm -hmm. Well, the nurse wasn't. So that makes it even more incredible mm -hmm. that it was ignored because they would have more knowledge and insight about, you know, whatever she was doing. So I find that very disturbing. And also, I mean, many years ago, I actually worked in clinical negligence in mm -hmm. the NHS. So, you know, I read some very horrific things about... But they were always genuine mistakes. They were always things that had just gone horribly wrong in theatre or, you know, somebody who wasn't well-trained administered the wrong drug or something mm. like that. And the painstaking time we took to investigate all of it mm. and to actually rule out kind of criminal doings... Yeah. 
And this was, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about 15, 20 years ago in the north of England. I won't name, name the hospital. But, you know, the process for that is definitely in, the, in place. So I don't understand what's happened here. And is what we've really got to get to the root of, is it just this particular hospital or does this happen in every NHS Well, apparently, in, one of the newspapers says this morning that they've launched an investigation into 4,000 other mm. yes. babies that Lucy Letby handled. And, yeah. 4,000? Yeah. It's incredible. And they're now fanning out across her whole career where she trained in Liverpool, yeah. other yeah. places that she worked at. And it's just, especially when the circumstantial evidence was so strong. I mean, when they were, when uh, investigations were first launched, they found out that she was the only one common denominator yeah. in terms of who was working. Mm -hmm. Why, the, in that situation, you don't even just say, look, we're going to press pause, investigate, we can't take these red... We can't just ignore red flags like this. They pressed on regardless. It really yeah. boggles the mind, definitely. Yeah, so and how did they come to the conclusion to ask the consultants to apologise to her? Because they reckoned they, they'd actually come to the conclusion that, yeah. that it was a witch hunt yes, right. and the doctors were actually sort of out to get her. Which just beggars belief, doesn't it? It doesn't make yeah, any it's sense. It's a story we're going to talk about throughout the rest of the morning. Let's move on now to the football, of course. You may have noticed there's a football match today. <laughs> um, and it's that time of the year, isn't it, um, panel, when people either pretend to like it or <laughs> get behind it for, for brownie points or maybe they're genuine fans. But um, there's been a lot of stick about who hasn't no, he isn't going there. Prince William isn't going. Rishi Sunak isn't going. King Charles isn't going. But, of course, he's roaring from the sidelines. Well, yes, yeah, so he's put out this... Uh, I don't know if it's a tweet, but it's appeared on social media. I think it might be an Instagram post saying, good luck today, Lionesses, and may you roar to victory, Charles R. And everybody's sort of clapping <laughs> about it. But I've got to be honest, I think it's really poor show that none of yeah. them, between them, are going. Especially when um, Queen Letizia of Spain will be there yeah. with her daughter. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a bit cheap of Prince William to put a Charlotte in a video to sort of say, well, you know, you know I do support women after all. Because the thing is, he loves football. He's really into it. Yeah. Well, so... He's top brass at the FA. Absolutely. Mm. Have you seen that video? Because I, I watched it a minute ago, <laughs> and I, I think, Tom, it feels like a hostage video. <laughs> it feels like, uh, you know, he's reading from a script, you know, there's a th he, he's been forced... Someone's into... brandishing a weapon behind the camera yeah, or something been... like that. Let's have that sort <laughs> he, he's of, been know. forced into this position, of course. There's been so much hoo-ha about him yes. not going, and we know he'd have been there if it was the blokes. Mm -hmm. we, so... Yeah, we should have a national rem representative there. I think yes, it's, it's poor show. Yeah. It is a poor show, it's a shame. Let it, let's hope it doesn't put them off. Yeah. I don't, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't think do it, it will despite. despite. No. <laughs> no, they really will. Um, Tom, to the Sunday Express. Mm -hmm. I mentioned I, I was surprised, because I thought this is yesterday's story, mm -hmm. that, um, that we're all reckoning that um, the problems we're having, stopping the boats and a lack of cooperation or perceived lack of cooperation <laughs> from the French, is their revenge for Brexit. Yes, so this is right up the comments of the former UK border chief, um, who has made the point that the EU are basically just digging in their heels on this particular question and I don't think you have to be a kind of paranoid Brexiteer to see that you've got a <laughs> no. bit of a point I mean on any if you, you know remember we have any kind of row with the EU or with leading EU member states and you've got Macron threatening, threatening to turn off the power to Jersey or whatever this kind of recrimination shall we say have been a feature of the post-Brexit sort of arrangement and they hide behind process don't they you've got Macron saying this isn't right you've got to negotiate with the EU the EU says computer says no because we don't have a mandate and so on and yet when push comes to shove the EU rules don't tend to mean too much if they need to cut a deal and they feel politically able to do so. So it is one of those things where, of course, you'll have Remainers saying, well, if you wanted an EU returns deal, you should be a member of the EU. But surely, if the EU lives up to its supposed humanitarian values, they should be deeply concerned about the fact that people are taking this perilous journey. They're departing from the EU in order to take that perilous journey. And surely it's within everyone's interest to stop that from taking place. So even though, as you say, it's a bit of yesterday's news, I still think that he's got a he's got a point as far as this is how the EU have taken to well, behaving. Well, I, I wonder you know. if he has if they have got a point. And I, I, I I'm the first to have a pop at the French, mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> <laughs> but can can the Tories ever just take responsibility for this? So they're going to blame the ECHR, the French police, Keir Starmer, lefty lawyers, the civil service, mm. the mainstream media. Yeah. Come on, you're in charge. You said you were going to stop the boats. You're not. Isn't this just like convenient scapegoat, Uri? Yeah, I mean, I don't really like this story. There's something about it that seems a bit <laughs> odd. It just seems there seems to be a hint of bitterness, especially if this is a former British border chief. Perhaps <laughs> there was an argument about why he isn't there anymore, <laughs> or she. I don't know if it's Marchley. I mean, yeah, I, 
I think the problem with this story is that actually if the Tories admitted we've made mistakes and now we're going to rectify it and then actually got the results, people would back the policy. Yeah, yeah. And they're not doing that. And they, instead, you keep getting these distractions. So I don't think it's the best move for the Tory party. I'm mean, not that they've done it on mm. purpose necessarily, but whoever's had a conversation about being the front page of the Express, yeah. maybe they should have thought twice about that. Yeah, that's the thing. They always look for scapegoats, but how about taking responsibility? Let's move on to your story here, Nikki, in the Daily Mail. Yes. Our good old friend Sadiq Khan <laughs> making headlines again. What about this one? White families don't represent real Londoners. <laughs> Well, this sounds like <laughs> something that's happened in the office, in the mayor's office, where people have had a discussion about suitable pictures to illustrate London life. And uh, somebody's taken notes, maybe written some notes on something, and then it somehow made its way out into the public and it should never have been seen. <laughs> oh, I see. But because the, the kind of language used, when you kind of read the whole report on it, uh, the mayor's spokesperson actually said the photo caption was added by a staff member in error. So that's just yeah, so, it was somebody... So the photo was published on the website. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's just... It's it's a photo of a white family, uh, you know, man, wife, two kids, walking along. I think you can see the parliament in the background. Yeah. And, um, and then somebody has written over the top, these white, uh, they don't represent real Londoners. Yes. And um, wow. what the heck? I mean, how did it get out like, like that in the first place? But... Uh, Everybody's now asking you, OK, Sadiq Khan, what is a real Londoner? Yeah, so now Why he's... can't a white family be a real Londoner? Wow. Well, absolutely. So that's what I'm saying. Like, there's obviously been some kind of discussion, because the other comments as well, that you know, criticising a, a picture that looks like... Uh, I don't know, it's like some corporate... <laughs> taking for some corporate video or something, and it says, look, staged and set up. So like, it's obvious this has come from some kind of yes. discussion. It's and it's also obvious that somebody in City Hall yeah. has leaked this, it, I think it is, leaked it on purpose because yes. they've it's had enough that, of the kind of discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's interesting, Tom, because, you know, we, we say all the time, oh, you know, look at that photograph, it ticks every diversity mm -hmm. box, you know, short of there being an amputee. You know, it, it seems like that's the direction of travel. Now it seems that this is actual City Hall remit. No, completely. At least that really... Um, pleasant kind of like racial identity bean counting which seems now to go into everything not just public relations but to all sorts of different things and again you're having a conversation about who doesn't doesn't constitute real Londoners it's a kind of inverse version of something that you'd hear the racist right going on about yeah. not too long ago and it's just really unpleasant and I think the, the thing about stories like this is when they get out into the public domain it just gives people a little bit of an insight into how entrenched mm. in that way of thinking a lot of people in positions of power are so even though it's a bit of an embarrassment it's a bit of a bit of a silly embarrassing story for Sadiq Khan it reflects a general mindset. It does, and it's not very nice, is it? OK, we've just got a minute left, so let's talk about the cost of a wedding. Mm. Mm. So the average cost is up to almost £25,000. That's the average cost of the yeah, average wedding. Think. Exactly. I'm not sure God. if that's the median or the mean, how they're calculating this. I'm sure there's some people who are really pushing up the average yeah. on the one end. There's some examples in the story of people floating down the aisle on kind of some sort of helium balloon rig. Drones, apparently, very... Um, in uh, favour drone videos, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As if yeah. you, ever, look at, as if you ever would look at your drone footage of your wedding. Gather around, kids, we're going to watch the drone footage right. of the wedding. I, I, I find all that stuff it. ghastly. And I, I must say, this, this is part of the reason I'm not married. I, I've been with been my, my missus well over 20 oh, years. I didn't know you were not married. No, I call, no, I call, I call her the wife, but, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I call her a lot of things. But, yes. but, uh, <laughs> it's I think... like Giles Brandreth always talks about his wife. He calls her his present wife. Yeah, yeah. I call her the commandant and other things too. But... But, but 25 grand on, on, yeah. on a day when, when people are barely struggling to buy a house, maybe it's helpful to explain why people aren't bothering. Well, <laughs> I don't know how anyone's got the money. I mean, I will be really honest, before COVID hit, I was going to have a very expensive wedding. It was probably around that figure. I'll be yeah. totally frank. Wow. And um, it was... So over the top, we were having alpaca champagne bearers. I'm not even kidding you. I know what alpaca I sound like right now. Bearers. I'm telling you because I'm because it's just so outrageous <laughs> what around. we had come up with. It was in you know it was in this beautiful barn and kind of like by the lake and yeah the alpacas were going to bring everyone champagne. Now a sausage <laughs> wow. dog was coming with an outfit on. And, um, a sausage dog. And then <laughs> and then COVID intervened. Somebody, somebody, somebody spiked my drink. <laughs> what am I hearing? I have to set myself up because when I think. <laughs> Back you might it. say thank God for COVID. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. so, and then we ended up being married just with a, a witness each and a photographer, and it was the most gorgeous day ever. Super, and great. then we had a party two years later for everyone. Yeah. So actually, we saved loads of money. It was fantastic, and I was. And now I just think, what on earth was I thinking? All for it. Okay, we have to leave it there. Anyone Tom watching Nikki. at the moment, please get in touch and tell us how much your wedding cost. Yeah, twenty-five grand alpacas with champagne. I've heard it all. <laughs> I know. I've, that's amazing. Uh, Tom and Nikki, thanks very much. We'll see you again in a, uh, less than an hour. Hour. <laughs>